Hello and welcome to another video. Today I'll be taking a look at my orchestration of the introduction theme to my Piano to Orchestra series. In my last video I analyzed the composition itself looking at harmonic, motivic, and rhythmic structures, so now I'll look at my orchestration decisions. Before I begin, I just want to take the time to thank my patrons on Patreon. I'm truly thankful for your support and I hope that all of the MIDI files, audio stems, and various materials are proving to be useful. And thank you to my supporters here on YouTube. I just crossed 600 subscribers, and I'd love to get that number up over 1,000. So please, if you haven't already, consider hitting that subscribe button so you don't miss future content. Okay, so if you haven't watched my previous video, I suggest you go back and watch that one first. I'll quickly play the piano version once more before diving into the orchestration. So even before I started composing this piece of music, I had a rough idea of an orchestration game plan. I wanted to write 30 seconds of music that transformed from piano into winds, then strings, then brass, then percussion, and I'd finish with the full orchestra. The challenge was switching between sections of the orchestra in such a short time while still making the overall piece of music cohesive and organically flowing from start to finish. While the actual introduction to my series features the piano at the beginning, my orchestration here doesn't include piano at all. When making that introduction video, I blended in piano at the start to show that transformation. In my full orchestra version, I made the following decisions about where the different sections of the orchestra would be featured. I start with woodwinds from measure 1 through 8, then switch to strings in measure 9 through 14, then briefly add brass in measures 15 and 16, then percussion from 17 to 19, then the full orchestra until the end. I think that the order of the sections appearing works well. I felt woodwinds needed to go first, as they wouldn't match the intensity needed later on in the piece. Likewise, I save brass towards the middle, where the dynamics of the piece will translate well to the brass section. I'll now take a look at each section individually, starting with the woodwinds in the first eight measures. There are three distinct elements to these first eight measures, and I've separated them into individual staves here. I gave the melodic figure starting in measure four to the flutes and oboes in unison. In measure seven, when they split into octaves, I gave the flutes the upper octave and oboes the lower octave. I gave the background eighth notes starting in measure one to two clarinets and a bass clarinet. I could have just given this triad to three B-flat clarinets, but the Berlin Woodwinds sample library only has two B-flat clarinets, and I suppose I was feeling too lazy to mix in another clarinet from a different library. If I were writing for a real orchestra, I probably would have chosen three B-flat clarinets for a more uniform timbre and balanced dynamics, but it really doesn't matter too much. So that leaves the measure five counterline material for two bassoons. So you can see I've distributed these parts based on range of the instruments and how those instruments would sound in the written registers. On to the next six measures, here is where I wanted to introduce and feature the string section. I gave the foreground melodic material at measure 9 to violins, both violins 1 and 2. Underneath the violins, I wanted the violas, cello, and basses to have these notes. But I chose not to give them the written rhythms here. I wanted a lush, sustaining string sound instead of an eighth note, quickly moving string texture. So I gave the low strings the same notes in the same registers as the left-hand piano part, but they're sustaining long notes instead. You'll see in a moment what I did with the moving line. So then in measure 13, the texture shifts with the subito piano eighth notes. I thought this would be a great time for string pizzicatos, so I gave the downbeats to cello and bass and the offbeats to divisi violas. Mm -hmm. 
I think this section requires a slightly closer look as the orchestration is a bit more complicated than the previous woodwind section. First, let's look at the violins. Notice that some chords have four notes and some have three notes in the piano. I wrote the piano part this way for ease of playing and for smoother voice leading. But when translating to strings, it's best to maintain four independent voices, though that can include an octave transposition, which is what I needed to do in the second, third, and fourth chords. In those chords, I double the top note down the octave. With Divisi violins, I can easily have the four separate parts needed. I give the top piano notes to the top violin Divisi part. I'll give the next highest voice in the piano to the top violin 2 Divisi part. Underneath the eighth note melody note in measure 9, it made more sense to have the entire string section play a uniform rhythm, as opposed to either sustain the previous note or to rest. And I think the G major harmonization works better underneath the D in the melody than the previous chord would. So then the next line would go to the second division of violin 1s, and the bottom voice in the piano part would go to the second division of violin 2s. You can see exactly where I needed to bump the top line down the octave. So here's sort of the same exact thing with a MIDI view. For those wondering, I actually bring in a different string sample library for Divisi parts. You could obviously just have a second violin 1 legato track and a second violin 2 legato track using the same library, but I find that I get a more realistic Divisi sound if I mix in a second library. I'm using Berlin Strings as my main library, and I bring in Cinematic Studio Strings as my Divisi string library. So now let's look at the same section of music in the lower strings in greater detail. As I said before, I gave the notes of the left-hand piano part to the strings, but instead of eighth notes, they are sustaining long notes. There are five separate notes here, so I decided to have basses play the root F while the celli and violas will take the upper four notes on Divisi chords. So the celli have the C and the A, and the violas have the B and the E. Then in measure 13, I give the offbeat eighths to pizzicato violas, and the downbeat eighths to pizzicato celli and basses, with the basses only playing on beat one. So putting together high and low strings, here's what that sounds like. Though I wanted to feature strings during these six measures, I didn't suddenly remove other instruments from the texture. In fact, I have the woodwinds continue through this phrase. And I gave the moving eighths to the bassoons, bass clarinet, and B-flat clarinets playing staccatos. I have the bassoons and bass clarinet splitting the downbeats and the B-flat clarinets in unison playing the top three notes of the gesture, which when put together form sort of an interesting syncopated rhythm. The low winds also continue to double low strings in measure 13 and 14 with staccato articulations. One thing I want to point out in the clarinet part is there is a slight discrepancy in articulation in the score versus the mock-up. In the syncopated rhythm, I have them slurring the second to the third note in each measure, and the staccato articulation on that third note stops the note immediately. A live performer would have no problem with this articulation, but getting sample libraries to do this is quite a bit trickier as they would have needed to sample both the legato transition and the stopped note articulation together. I find that using staccatos for all of the notes when mocking this up is better than trying to get a legato note to work properly. On to measures 15 and 16, where the brass are introduced and featured. The texture in the piano part is very simple, with a harmonized melody in the right hand, and a driving eighth note rhythmic left hand on the root note. I'd run into trouble if I had to try to copy and paste this exact piano part into brass, so I'll take a look at what adjustments I made starting with trumpets. The top notes of the right hand piano part are the melody notes and should be emphasized in the orchestration over the harmony notes below it. So I decided to have three trumpets in unison on the melody. While technically those notes in that octave are playable, they are very high for trumpet, and entering on those notes having not played at all prior to this moment is out of the question. So I moved them down the octave. I gave horns those harmony notes, and to fit their range and keep them below the melody, I moved them down the octave as well. Since the first two chords are the same notes, I combined them into one chord, and I also doubled the top note of that chord down the octave to give the fourth horn part its own note. <laughs> 
I gave low brass the left hand material with tuba on the lowest octave, bass trombone on the upper octave, and then two trombones on notes that I added above the F using the rest of the notes from the F major chord. So that's C and A. I did this to help fill out the complete register for a thicker, richer texture. So putting the brass together, here's what we get. On to the next three measures, here I feature percussion on the Subito Piano high register material. I chose to use mostly pitched percussion and keyboard instruments here, although I have a suspended cymbal roll and crescendo into this measure, so throughout the three measures you hear the cymbal ringing. I chose to have Celeste play the line almost verbatim, although I rearranged the notes of the supporting chord just a bit. I also doubled the top melody line with glockenspiel, and I doubled the supporting notes with vibraphone. All three instruments have a metallic bell-like timbre in this high range, and obviously the cymbal has a metallic sound as well. I think glockenspiel helps punctuate this melody as it's a bit more piercing than celeste. So moving on to the last section for measures 20 until the end, there are really just two different things happening here in the piano part. The eighth notes in the right hand, which I gave to upper woodwinds, upper brass, and xylophone, and the left hand material, which I gave to low winds, low brass, and low strings. I then gave strings, horns, and low winds the last measure chord. I'll take a closer look at each section of the orchestra in these last four measures, starting with woodwinds. I gave the top three notes of the right hand to piccolo and two flutes, all up the octave. In measure 21, the G sharp of the first flute moves down by step to G natural, and I decided at that point that I didn't want the flute to go back up to G-sharp after, so I maintained that downward voice leading, and I filled in the octave between the piccolo and the oboes. Then below the flutes, I have oboes and clarinets scored with an enclosed voicing, where oboe 1 and clarinet 1 are both on the A, but clarinet 2 is scored above oboe 2. The English horn is then given the low B. The bass clarinet and bassoons are given the left hand material, but positioned down the octave until measure 22 when they are at pitch. They don't have the exact same notes as I've adjusted the voice leading where I saw fit. The contra bassoon enters in measure 22 to take over the lowest octave from the second bassoonist in the previous measure. So here are the winds together in this section. So now looking closer at the brass section here, the trumpets are positioned in fourths. I really liked how that sounded, so I extracted fourths from this right hand piano texture. That's the high A, the E, and the B. Underneath the trumpets, the horns have the top four notes of the right hand, transposed down one octave. Both horns and trumpets are in very solid parts of their ranges for this passage. I also have horns play four of the notes from the final chord. The low brass instruments essentially have the same part as the low winds, with trombones in a similar configuration to bassoons and bass clarinet, and tuba in a similar configuration to contra bassoon. So here's brass altogether. So here's a closer look at the strings during the last four measures. I certainly could have doubled the right hand of the piano in violins alongside upper winds and brass, but I chose to have them play tremolos on the A and E, the root and the fifth of the chord, in octaves. The tremolo violins help in building and maintaining the energy level and fill the sonic space between eighth notes of the winds and brass. The violas, celli, and basses have the left hand part of the piano, with violas and celli on the divisi staccatos, and the basses entering in measure 22, similar to how tuba and contrabassoon entered at this time. While low brass and winds were for the most part scored in octave below the written pitches of the left hand of the piano, the low strings are mostly at pitch, with the violas even barring some of the notes from the right hand. Finally, all these strings are divisi, except basses on the last chord. <laughs> 
with basses doubling the second division of celli down the octave. So strings all together here sound like this. So lastly, the percussion section. I already mentioned earlier that the xylophone was doubling the right hand of the piano. It's really the only pitched percussion that can be heard over this texture that isn't metal. So I thought the wood sound would work much better than metal here, as the wood doesn't ring quite as much, so the articulations can be much clearer. I double that rhythm with wood block, so another wooden timbre that fits nicely with xylophone. And in the low register I have timpani doubling the bass line with bass drum highlighting the last fortissimo accented note in measure 22. Here's the percussion section all together. <laughs> So if I put each section together, starting with the first eight measures of woodwinds music, then six measures of strings, with low woodwinds providing the motion, then two measures of brass, then three measures of percussion, then finally four measures of the full orchestra, we get something like this. finished my original objective of having each instrumental section featured during a different musical section, but there's still a ways to go. You might notice that the transitions between musical sections or phrases are non-existent, and thus the overall flow of the piece is not very good. In order to improve the transitions between sections or the overall fluidity of the piece, you'll want to think about how to bring in the instrumental sections less abruptly. Obviously sometimes abruptness is exactly what you want, but that's not the case here. By adding other sections of instruments into the middle ground or background, we can support and even enhance the music, and can even make the foreground instruments more effective at their roles. So how did I achieve better transitions and better middle and background support in this piece? Let's look at the first two sections of the piece and the transition between them. There are two places we can help make a smoother transition, here and here. If you bring in the strings early and have them move from background to foreground in that span of time, the transition between sections will feel more connected. I used dynamics and register to help in that transition, so they'll start soft and crescendo to measure 9, and the violins start low and move up in register to where they take over in measure 9. I'm using notes that are already present in the winds, which allows them to start in the background and transition to the foreground. Here's what the strings sound like alone on that transition now. And after measure 9, it makes a lot of sense to let the upper woodwinds continue through the phrase. Think of it as violins joining them on the melody, as opposed to switching from winds to strings. Violins will still be the dominant sound over flutes and oboes, just by nature of the instruments. But by not removing the winds, again, the transition is much smoother. Here are winds and strings together now. So I went section by section and applied that same strategy for making smoother transitions. Percussion instruments and instruments like the harp are especially good at assisting in these transitions between sections. I added a harp glissando going into measure 9 to help bring us into this new section. I also have harp articulating the cello eighth notes in measure 13 using staccato articulations. I'll show one more example of this in the section where brass are featured. I support them with strings using violin and viola ascending tremolos and the low string eighth notes that doubly trombone and tuba rhythms. In the next section of music, while percussion is featured, I continue the high string tremolo texture, but I back off in dynamics. Tremolos are great at maintaining or building energy, and here I use them to suspend that energy level, even when the overall dynamics are much lower. Making an effective orchestration involves several steps. I mentioned how I started with a game plan, sort of an overall form, including where I wanted the foreground material to be placed within the orchestra. But the second step, and just as important, is filling in the smaller details, like middle ground and background materials. Think of it like drawing a picture. First you draw the outlines of the shapes, and maybe you add some colors on top of those shapes, 
that would be the foreground material. But to make the picture more realistic, you start adding those finer details like shadows or wrinkles or reflections of light. Those background details are ultimately just as important in creating an effective work of art or music. So here's the full orchestra version one last time. So thanks so much for watching, I hope this video was helpful. Please click the like button and subscribe to my channel if you enjoyed the video. See you next time.